On your Thursday episode of Locked On Raptors, the Toronto Raptors lose a game of almost basketball to the Sacramento Kings. I was there, and it made me sad. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, March the 21st, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley, watching these Toronto Raptors games so you don't have to. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can follow my work over on the website that ain't so good, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us on the Locked On Raptors Discord server. Still a little bit of time to get your entries in. By the time this comes out, you may have missed the boat, but you can get your entries in for the Locked On Raptors uh, bracket challenge on the women's bracket as well as that tournament gets kicked off tomorrow. So still plenty of time to join us in our bracket challenges in the Discord. Talk about March Madness. Talk about the draft. Talk about the Raptors, I guess. It's all there for you. Come hang out. We'd love to see a link in the description free to join as well always and of course you can find the show for free wherever you get your podcast follow subscribe rate review tell a friend always appreciated when you support the show however you support the show we're on youtube as well you can subscribe to the youtube channel hit the notification bell and get a push notification that says hey stop everything sean's talking every single time the show's about to premiere so thanks in advance for doing that and today's show is brought to you by friends over at FanDuel. make every moment more new customers get 200 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet that's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. And we will get started here talking about a Toronto Raptors 123 to 89 loss to the Sacramento Kings. It's the same script we've seen. Utterly depleted roster. No Emmanuel quickly in this game. No RJ Barrett in this game. Both have a personal reasons. Obviously, best wishes and thoughts to both of them. Uh, no Scotty Barnes. No Jakob Pertl. And you get the same result. The Raptors have gotten now, what, eight games in a row? Which is a loss that's dispiriting and kind of was never even remotely close. And frankly, you couldn't expect it to be close. When, again, you're rolling out a starting five of Bruce Brown, Gary Trent Jr., Ochai Abaji, Grady Dick, and Kelly Olynyk, which would be a very nice second unit. Uh, starting them against a team in the Kings that's like playing for stuff was just not going to cut it. And so we're here picking up the pieces after another loss. 23 and 46 are your Toronto Raptors. They have doubled their win total with their losses. It's been a long, long time since things have been this grim. And look, I want to have big, broad takeaways from these games. That's what I'm paid to do. I'm here to give you the takes. I don't really know where the takes are supposed to come from because this is barely basketball that we're watching. The Raptors' half-court offense in this game, just an utterly lifeless mess, completely just kind of botching basic dribble handoffs and, you know, next pass in the sequence situations. Just ugly, ugly stuff. Again, to be expected with the players who are out there, but the players who are out there not exactly covering themselves in glory in this one either. And I was at this game. Uh, I, I got some free tickets uh, because, you know, season ticket holders don't want to go to these games, I guess. So I got some free tickets through a friend uh, just before game time, like two hours ahead. I, I went down, paid way too much money for concessions, sat there, great seats, had a fun time watching pro basketball, mostly enjoyed watching De'Aaron Fox be really, really fast and uh, Demonis Sabonis be extremely strong and mean to play against. But, you know, that, that was the stuff that was exciting. That was the interesting stuff in this one. The Raptors did not offer a whole lot in terms of entertainment, which is, you know, a problem for an extremely expense, expensive entertainment product. I'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, you know, I want to talk about Malik Monk as well coming up later in the show. I guess I'm just kind of rambling off the top here about how bad this basketball game was and not giving you the idea of what's coming up today. But yeah, we got the good, the bad, and the hmm coming up at the end of the show. Uh, we're going to weave in some non raptor stuff into that. We're going to talk Malik Monk as a potential free agent target coming up. But I guess if I'm trying to find a takeaway from this game, I, I guess the guy to talk about is Grady Dick. Pretty rough night for him in this one. One of eight overall, just five points. Uh, you know, he played a healthy dose of minutes, played 32 minutes, started again for the Raptors in this one. But it continues a pretty rough month of March for Grady Dick. And, you know, again, I, I don't know how surprising any of this is. I don't think it's particularly concerning. I've kind of seen 
all I needed to see from Grady Dick in, in his rookie season to think, okay, this is a dude for the future. I think when he was playing off of Scotty Barnes and Jakob Pertle and banging in threes and running the floor well, I was like, all right, there's something to grow on here. He's young. He's got to get stronger. He gets moved off his spot very easily. Um, you know, obviously he's a, a liability in half court defense as an individual defender at the moment, smart team defender. We know all the things Grady Dick does well and doesn't do well at this point. And this month of March, I think is very much just a symptom of too much, too fast for a guy who should be a bench player. And I do think it probably solidifies that Grady Dick going into next season should also be a bench player. I don't think any sort of ideas or grand visions of him becoming a starter for this team next season are all that realistic. I think there's lots to work on here, and I would rather it be a slow build for him of, all right, get into a spot on the bench where you're comfortable, you know, play some good minutes. Maybe you close some games here and there because your shooting gravity is that important to the offense and, and sort of ease him into an eventual starting role, which I'm sure the Raptors have in mind for him down the line sometime in the future but uh yeah it's been a pretty rough go for him in march 9.4 points a game 2.5 boards 1.8 assists the shooting splits which were absolutely red hot over the course of february really calming down 36 percent from two that's or sorry 36 percent overall 31 percent from three and 100 percent at the line so that's nice but not getting to the line very much he's not getting to the rim as much uh just kind of a lot of leaning on that three-point shot one of six from deep last night and just a 46% true shooting percentage, which is below the Malachi Flynn zone. Not what you want to see. But again, I think the circumstances of this team are just not putting Grady Dick in a very good position to succeed. And, you know, the way things are with rookies, rookies are bad. Rookies lead to negative play. That's very much been the case with Grady Dick as well. The Raptors are a minus, uh, or sorry, Grady Dick has a minus 20.6 on off differential, meaning the Raptors are 20.6 points per 100 possessions better when he's off the floor than when he is on. It is what it is, man. I, you know, it's this is what rookies do. They lose their minutes. And when you have rookies who are not surrounded by high end talent, they're going to lose their minutes dramatically. And that's just the way it is. The legs don't quite seem there on his shot so much. You know, he's played a lot of ball of late. He was a you know a rookie coming out. You know, I think it's always a, a bit of a culture shock to sort of set into the NBA where it's like, oh, we play games like for six months, huh? And we play them uh, like every other night. And oh, God, I'm playing now 30 minutes a game because this team has no players. And I'm the kind of focus of a lot of what this team is doing. I, I totally understand that there might be a bit of a drop off in the shooting proficiency for a guy who's being thrown to the wolves like Grady Dick kind of is. Um, and, you know, I think a, particularly like a player like him, he's one who benefits from the space and advantages that other players create, right? He's someone with his gravity who playing off of a Scotty Barnes who commands two to the ball very often, um, you know, really demands the defense's attention. Jakob Pertl, who has roll gravity, who has work at the elbows with his passing, um, a really fantastic screener. That's the thing they really miss right now. Olenek's a good screener. They have no other good screeners on this team right now. And that's affecting a guy who really does a lot of damage coming off of screens and getting sort of sprung into open space for shots by big hulking dudes setting mean screens on prospective defenders. And that's just not there for Grady Dick right now. His threes, you know, just sort of eye test wise, I haven't gone into the data on the contest data because the contest data is kind of noisy anyway, but the threes don't look like they're coming as smoothly within the flow of the offense. They're a little more contested and it's just, it's been tough. He's not walking into those mid range jumpers either, right? The scouting report is kind of out on, oh, Grady Dick can take a, you know, a, a closeout make a couple steps and pull up for a mid-range J and that's going to be butter for him. And that was just not there for him last night. The Kings were totally prepared for it. A couple of cases where he kind of walked into it, thought he had the mid-range jumper, went up, either got blocked or had to pass out of it. It's just, hey, this is life. This is learning the NBA. Ultimately, these will be good growing pains for Grady Dick to go through. And there's still good stuff, right? Like some of the passes he threw last night, really nifty, really slick. And I continue to be pretty impressed by his passing. And I continue to be pretty bullish on him being like a three, four, five assist guy sometime down the line just because he's smart and makes the right next play so often that it's just going to beget assists by doing that as often as he does. So uh, there was some good stuff there, a really beautiful pass through traffic to a cutting Bruce Brown for a bucket. Um, that was sort of the highlight play, I suppose. 
But yeah, tough one for Grady Dick. That's probably the big, you know, that's what I went to this game hoping to see was, hey, let's see Grady Dick take 30 shots and play 40 minutes and sort of be the focal point. Didn't quite get my wish there. I uh, got a lot of Gary Trent Jr., got a lot of Ochai Baji, got a lot of Jemias Ramsey in this one, but not so much of Grady Dick, and that's fine. The struggles, I think, are totally understandable. And I think coming into next season, we know what his role is going to be. He's going to be a bench shooter. He's going to play with Kelly Olynyk. He's probably going to play with staggered versions of lineups featuring Emmanuel Quickly and Scotty Barnes. And that is going to put him on uh, in, in a position, I think, to succeed in a way that he was very much succeeding when this team was intact when Grady Dick was also getting run. So uh, yeah, not concerned, but that is the big thing to watch right now. And right now it's not so fun to watch for one Grady Dick, which is fine. We'll come back on the other side. We're kind of done talking about the Raptors end of this game on this podcast. We're going to talk about a guy who maybe was doing a bit of an audition for the Toronto Raptors last night, Malik Monk. Should the Raptors be pursuing him in the offseason? We'll get into that coming up in just one second. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. You're not having your entire bracket ruined on day one and killing the experience and killing your chances of winning anything by the end of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That is pretty sweet right now i've put all of my eggs into the purdue basket in the locked on raptors uh listener bracket challenge uh maybe that's a bad idea they lost to a 16 seed last year could be really bad but zach Eady, i'm the zach Eady believer baby let's go he's a very good college player and this seems like maybe purdue's got themselves a bit of a walk to the final four we shall see but right now you can go and bet on your team of choice at FanDuel. that's 200 bucks in bonus bets on point spreads money lines whatever it might be you can even pick who's going to win it all with those bonus bets all you got to do is win one five dollar bet visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Ever wonder what kind of adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2023 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. You can also, though, check out the 2024 Nissan Armada, which is going to change the way or what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada to go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. And we continue on here, rounding up the show. Well, not rounding up the show. It's just segment two. Boy, oh boy, I wish we were done talking about this basketball game, but we're not. We got two more segments, baby. Uh, let's dive in to, uh, again, not a Raptors takeaway necessarily, but... A guy who I think is someone Raptors fans are going to think a lot about in coming weeks and months. And yeah, I guess weeks and months is the time frame we're looking at here. Malik Monk, the prospective sixth man of the year for the Sacramento Kings, threw down an absolutely vicious dunk last night that kind of killed the vibe after a great putback dunk by but putback dunk by Bahamadou Gay. Right back the other way, Malik Monk just goes vicious with his dunk the other end. It's a cool player. It's a very cool player. And you could find any solace in watching last night's game. Watching Malik Monk do his thing in person was certainly one of those things for me. And he really popped off the screen, right? Like he, he's just like a really dynamic second unit player to come in. And the Kings have been like kind of going as Malik Monk goes in many ways over the last couple of seasons. Obviously, Fox and Sabonis, very important to their success as well. But I think this year, like Monk's playmaking, his, his scoring pop obviously has been there. He's just had a really damn good season and he's going to get paid this summer and he might get paid to the degree that the Sacramento Kings cannot afford to keep him around. He has this contract. It was like a two year, $19 million deal. 
that I don't believe the Kings can properly extend him off of with bird rights because of the rules of the CBA. At least they can't extend him off of it at a number that Malik Monk would say, hey, that's what I'm worth because he's worth a lot more than, you know, just under 10 million bucks a year now. He's had himself a really good couple of years for building up his value. He's only 26 years old. And guys with his skill set who can score and make plays, like those are the types of dudes who make money, especially in a free agent market that's not exactly stuffed with really good players who are going to be huge difference makers. So for a Raptors team that has a pathway here to significant cap, cap space, you know, it depends on who you sort of look at. Um, you know, Spot Track says they can get up to 43 million bucks in practical cap space. It's probably a little bit less than that. Obviously, they have Emmanuel quickly to sign. His cap holds about 12 million, million bucks. That's a low cap hold that helps them get there. You'd have to renounce Gary Trent Jr.'s cap hold and, of course, uh, decline Bruce Brown's option to get to that cap space. But there's a pathway there to enough cap space to throw a very competitive offer at someone like Malik Monk, who, you know, I don't think really stands out as like fitting the bill of what the Raptors really need. Like the Raptors. I've said this, I said it on yesterday's show, I'll say it a million times between now and the summer. The Raptors need wings. The Raptors need length. The Raptors need defense. And I don't think Malik Monk really brings any of those things. He's a 6'3 guard, and he's a score-first guy. He's not exactly renowned as a very positive defender. That doesn't mean there isn't good stuff that Malik Monk brings. You know, first off, I have to say, maybe has like a top five basketball reference nickname, his basketball reference nickname is God of Dunk, which he very much lived up to last night. And frankly, I'm okay giving the full bag to anyone whose nickname is God of Dunk. The Raptors need some dunks. Malik Monk brings the dunks. That's like argument number one in favor of bringing him in. And maybe that's the only argument you need. If we're going more basketball related arguments, again, the offense is the thing that he brings, right? He's just extra scoring punch. He's someone who could be a backup lead guard for you. When Emmanuel quickly sits, you pair him with, you know, Scotty Barnes in a second unit or something like that. Pair him with Jakob Pertl, pair him with Kelly Olynyk, and you can totally get by with him being your lead guard creatively. And he brings just a lot of scoring punch. Again, he's probably going to win six man of the year for a team that's a top six team in the Western Conference right now. He's a very positive impact player. That said, the defense is the concern. And it's also a concern of... Is it the right idea to devote a ton of financial resources to a very good player who doesn't quite fit the direct needs of the team? It's sort of a talent thing, right? I think the argument in favor of it is like your team is just better off, even if the fit's not great. The team is better off if you have Malik Monk instead of Bruce Brown and Gary Trent Jr. on your team, right? Like that is sort of where it lines up. And with Gary Trent Jr. walking, there's a pretty easy starter's job to go and sell Malik Monk on. It, you know, in this case where you're signing Malik Monk, Gary Trent Jr. is walking because you've renounced his bird rights. And so, you know, that's like a pretty easy pitch. Hey, you like playing with your Kentucky buddy in uh, in Sacramento? We got a Kentucky buddy for you and Emmanuel quickly. Come be our starting two guard, fill in for Gary Trent Jr. And, you know, profit and make a lot of money. Like that's the pitch. And it's maybe a pretty compelling one when you compare the other teams that are going to have cap space out there. Maybe the Raptors can actually get this thing done if Malik Monk wanted to come to Toronto and if, if you know, the Raptors are, are pursuing him. Like, I, th I don't think it's crazy to suggest he's not the type of free agent who's so good that is out of the Raptors range of free agent possibilities. So there's that. I do think I probably lean against it a little bit just because of the defense thing and the sort of numbers that you look at with the Monk Fox Sabonis trio or the Monk Fox lineups, they kind of paint a bit of a sort of underwhelming picture, I suppose you could say. Uh, lineups that feature both him and Fox in the backcourt are only a slight positive this season per clean the glass, getting carved up pretty bad on defense to the tune of 118 defensive rating. Um, that's not very good. You're getting absolutely torched, and the offense has to be so good to get you by there. And hey, again, there's, there's mildly positive lineups. The offense gets them by because Monk and Fox is a pretty dynamic duo. I would argue Fox is more dynamic and a higher end player than Emmanuel quickly is right now. And so you got to bake in that the Fox monk pairing would be more potent overall on offense than the Fox, sorry, the, the monk quickly pairing. So there's that. There's also the concern with the sort of fit when you work in Scotty Barnes, you know, I think you can kind of squint and see, okay, there's kind of some similarities here between a Fox monk Sabonis trio and a, 
uh, quickly Monk Barnes trio, just in terms of how Scotty Barnes likes to work from the elbows. Obviously, him and Sabonis, not the same player at all. Sabonis is an absolute bear of a man, an incredible rebounder, a way better interior scorer, all that stuff. But Scotty does a lot of the playmaking stuff that Sabonis does within the Kings offense. Obviously, Yaka Pertle does a lot of that too. This is kind of muddying that, where Sabonis is their starting center. Barnes would not be the starting center with that backcourt duo you would have the sort of backstop of Yaka Pertle's rim protection so maybe there's a higher defensive ceiling for that team than this Kings team's ha- Kings team has although I think the offense could be a little bit less potent because Sabonis is fantastic and Fox is like you know a borderline all-NBA player every year and so there's all these sort of trades and balances and, and all that stuff but either way the Fox Monk Sabonis lineups this year minus 3.3 per 100 possessions obviously played together a lot they're just not that great. They get absolutely torched on defense to a tune of like 123 defensive rating. It's just not good. And so can you really build like a real competitive team with like a quickly monk backcourt with RJ Barrett's defense on the wing with Scotty Barnes being a better rim protector than a wing defender with Yaka Pertle being your traditional drop. Like I think he'd be a better defense than the Kings are for sure, but is it a good enough defense and is the offense good enough to outstrip the defense? That's the big thing, right? The Kings offense has been an absolute wagon the last couple of years, less so this year. They were like the best offense ever last season, like 13th this year, which still makes them a wagon by historical standards. And we know that when they're really humming, they're really damn good. Um, You know, I don't know if the Raptors could reach that. I mean, maybe they could, right? Like quickly Monk, Barrett, Barnes, Pirtle, like, that's probably a very good offense. It's probably the basis of something in the top 12 or something like that. But is it a good enough to outstrip the defensive issues? I think that's, you know, it might be in the eye of the beholder. I am a little bit concerned considering the lack of other wing talent and the lack of other avenues to add wing talent that the Raptors would have if they use their cap space on Malik Monk. The trade possibilities go at the door, mostly if you don't have Bruce Brown's contract to send out as salary ballast, right? Um, the draft guys like, No wing you're drafting in this year's draft is helping you win basketball games next season. It's just not going to happen. Watch Cody Williams last night, one of the top prospects in this draft for Colorado, uh, look totally lost and just kind of be like a tumbleweed out there, just kind of floating in the wind, doing nothing. Like These are going to be projects, these wings that you take in the draft. And so I don't know if it's the best use of resources, but... Malik Monk's a guy to watch. I, 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 you know, as a pure talent play, as a pure sort of infusion of life and elect- electricity and what the Raptors do, could do a lot worse. And, and you know, a quickly Monk, Barrett, Barnes, Pirtle team with Grady Dick and Kelly Olynyk coming off the bench, like that team's going to score a whole lot of points. It's going to have games where it completely shreds the nets, and that's fun. The defense, I'm concerned about a little bit there, and so uh, you know. We'll sort of rank our potential things the Raptors could do with their flexibility this summer. Monk is the first guy we've really looked at here, but you know, he's, you know, I almost would wonder if I, maybe, I don't know, it's tough. Like we talked about like Najee Marshall and Pat Williams is like a duo of wings you go and try to get on yesterday's show. Would you rather just getting those wings, Pat Williams, Najee Marshall, or just going to give some money to Malik Monk and figuring out the wing thing later? It's a tough one. I'd probably go Monk over those two wings, but it's uh, and that's just because of the talent play. But I think it's a pretty fascinating one because you're going to have to pay Malik Monk a lot of money, and that's also a consideration to be uh, weighing as well. Fascinating stuff, but I-, I just couldn't help but think of Malik Monk as a potential Toronto Raptor watching him last night eviscerate the Toronto Raptors to the tune of 17 points off the bench and a couple of nasty dunks and all that good stuff. So uh, those are my Malik Monk thoughts. Not going to be the last time we talk about Malik Monk. He is one of the key free agents in a summer where the Raptors have some cap space if they want it. So he's going to be someone we got our eyes on for sure. We'll come back on the other side, round it up the good, the bad, and the Tristan De Silva. Yes, he is the hmm, not at all related to that Raptors game. And that's a good thing. We'll come back on the other side, get into that to close out the show. Today's show is sponsored by Better Help. And look, sometimes you just got to have someone to talk to, to. It's nice to have the opportunity to get things off your chest with someone who is there just to listen, has no ulterior motives, no agenda. They're just there for you. Big or small, certain, th- certain things can really start to get to you. Maybe you want to figure out a way to get back into some sort of exercise routine and you just can't get out of that rut of not wanting to work out. I've been there before, no doubt about it. Maybe you have a relationship that you want to have a little more TLC with. 
whatever it might be in your life, BetterHelp can help you find the solutions, help you understand yourself so you can then be a better version of yourself and improve and get better. Everyone wants to do that. Everyone wants to be a better person for the people around them and BetterHelp can help you go and do that. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team and it's all always important to get things off your chest once in a while. I know a lot of people who have really benefited from therapy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Just visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. Right out of the show here, the way we do after every Toronto Raptors basketball game. It is the good, it's the bad, it's the hmm, a thing I liked, a thing I didn't like, a thing that's got me a little intrigued from the most recent Toronto Raptors basketball game with a bit of a twist coming for the hmm, as I've teased, as we're going to talk about not a Toronto Raptor, but maybe a future Toronto Raptor at the end of this here segment. Let's get into the good. The good is, look, say what you will about this iteration of the team, but... They're essentially throwing out a team of dudes who are put on this earth to try to bring down the rim with thunderous jams. And hey, you're watching a game, you go to a game, you get tickets for free from your friend, you go sit you know, in the, the bottom bowl and you're excited to watch some basketball. You know that the result is probably going to go one way. You know the Raptors are not really the team they're supposed to be. It's not representative of anything, but... Man, I uh, if you get some dunks out of it, it feels all right. And there were some good dunks last night. Ochai Abaji feels like he's good for one lob from Kelly Olynyk every single night. That's great. Jemias Ramsey throwing down big yams all the time. He had a couple sort of avenues for big yams last night that I don't think he quite got the opportunity to uh, take advantage of here and there. But, you know, he's always there lurking. He just looks like he's always looking for his next dunk and next uh, poster victim. Jordan Wara tries. He might have the least dunk finish I've ever seen, but he pulled off some nice moves last night, at least. He had that, like, behind the legs or th- yeah, through the legs, behind the back in traffic thing that was pretty fun. Um, you know, but, yeah, Jordan Wara, he's trying to dunk. doesn't do it successfully, but he's trying out there. Mohamedou Gade, that pretty sick putback. We're in it for the dunks at this point. We're in it for the court cuts, in it for the highlights, and the Raptors are at least offering a little bit of that in, in between uh, spurts of completely – disconnected terrible basketball so yay dunks the bad you know just kind of the general level of sadness that permeated that building last night is my bad like just like a pretty grim situation man the the i know you can't at all control for injuries or personal leaves of absences like it is what it is the raptors have the players they have and i don't think this is an example of them trying to tank necessarily like they their two best players got hurt and are out for the year and their next two best players got uh you know the bad horrible things happening in their personal lives and so i mean we don't know what's going on with quickly but hopefully everything's okay no timetable for his return so best wishes there either way like it's just it's the reality of it it's it's tough (laughs) it's when you're this uncompetitive it's a really sobering experience going to a game I, i remember going to a game in the first season post Chris Bosch, I sat third row with my brother who was disinterested. And frankly, I can't uh, disagree because Samardo Samuels was playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers and starting and playing heavy minutes. Like it was, it was rough stuff. A lot of Manny Harris. It, it was, and these are names that some people may not even understand or know because you became fans way later than 2011. But there's a real t- like cost to being this lifelessly uncompetitive. And I don't think the Raptors can find themselves in this spot next year. You cannot lose the rope so badly in your first 40 games that your last 40 games mean nothing. There's a cost to it. There's a toll. It makes going to the game feel like a chore for some people. Like People paid money. I didn't pay money to be there last night, but people paid money to be there last night. That sucks. That's not an entertainment product. It's just not. Like, Yeah, the Kings did some cool stuff, but this game was out of touch by the middle of the second quarter. It was not a competitive thing. And... This isn't even just a Raptors thing. This is uh, even like a bigger picture problem to me. Look at the standings in the NBA right now. The bottom 11 teams in the standings are all on some form of losing streak. It's non-competitive. And it's a problem because a lot of the teams ahead of them in the standings are like actually playing for stuff. And it totally tilts the sort of competitive integrity of the league if teams are just walking into a building facing no resistance and walking out with wins like it kind of 
spoils the entire standings when the bottom third of it is completely rotten and those teams are not trying, they're not competitive and they're just not in it. And, and so I don't know what you do. Obviously, like the draft situation, like teams are incentivized to try to lose games. That's bad. Like I, I understand the strategy of, oh, take advantage of the rules as they exist. Doesn't mean the rules don't suck. Doesn't mean the rules aren't like kind of a massive threat to the overall competitive quality of the nba like i know people are worried about gambling and refs and scoring like i think this where a third of the league just doesn't take the last third of the season seriously is a way bigger threat than any of those things to the health of the nba and there's got to be some kind of fix because right now it's a joke like it's not just the raptors it's all of these teams in the bottom of the standings actively losing games not fielding competitive rosters and just handing wins. I had Nick Angstad from the Mavs show last night text me like, really? The Raptors couldn't throw the Mavs a bone by giving the Kings at least a game? Like, no, they can't. Like, it's just not the reality at this point. And you're seeing races in other conferences affected by teams not throwing anything out. Again, I know what the Raptors situation is, and I know they can't really avoid what it is right now, especially with Barrett and quickly Barnes and Pirtle. Maybe they could be rushed back. Probably not anyway with the nature of their injuries. And so like whatever, they're out for the season. What the Raptors are is what the Raptors are. But you can't tell me there wouldn't be a little bit more incentive to try to be competitive down the stretch if they hadn't totally lost the rope in the first half of the year. Or if there was something to actually play for down the stretch, which is kind of leading me into my last thought here, which is if you're a fan of uh, women's hockey, you know the PWHL has gotten underway this year. And they announced a couple weeks ago their new draft lottery format. First of all, they also have a new playoff format where the top teams get to draft who they play, which is awesome. That rules. Um, when you start a new league, do cool rules. That's a really good thing. Um, but when it comes to the Raptors, sorry, when it comes to the, uh, P, the lottery situation with the PWHL, they're using the gold plan, which is essentially uh, put forth by this guy like Adam Gold. I don't know where Adam Gold's from. It's just the name attached to the plan, whatever. He put this plan forth in like 2012, which is essentially once you're eliminated, you start to accrue points for the lottery once you're eliminated. And you win games after you're eliminated. And the more games you win after that, the better it is for your standings. Obviously, this benefits teams that are eliminated first, but those teams are also much worse and have a harder time winning. So it balances the playing field a little bit and makes there's so there's actually stakes in the last quarter of seasons for really bad teams. The Raptors are 15 games out of the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference right now. They have 14 games left. They are mathematically eliminated from being a top six team in the Eastern Conference. What if right now, these last 14 games, 13 games, whatever it is, what if there was actually stakes to these games and playing hard and trying to go for wins and like having players play meaningful minutes in games that mean something for the team? Like that would be cool. Maybe the players don't care about draft lottery odds. Maybe this is a, a faulty concept because of that, but there was actually something for these teams to play for, for these front offices to be incentivized to push for. You would see teams shut down guys less for, you know, nicks and cuts and things like that. You would see, I, I think, just like more competitive games, even if teams aren't winning these games, like giving the Kings a run and having like a competitive fun game where both teams are playing for something, even though that something is very different, like that would be pretty sweet. The gold plan, do it. Like the NBA needs something like that to make this last stretch of the season more interesting for the teams that are really bad. Because you look at the schedule every night, man, and it's like, oh, like, okay, there's two games of note here because most of these games are tank team versus competitive team. And we know what the competitive team is going to do to that tank team. They're going to spank them all over the floor as the Kings did last night. Again, I'm just some dude on a podcast. I don't have all of the data. I'm not in the competition committee. But there's got to be something they can do to juice up the end of these seasons because right now it's a grim scene. My hmm is uh, Tristan Da Silva, uh, who had himself a really nice game last night for Colorado in their first four win over Boise State. 20 points, three boards, one assist, seven of 11, three of six from deep. Really smooth looks off the catch, uh, sort of good movement for him as an off ball guy. Nice cutting here and there under the basket, you know, just like. Doing a lot of Darko stuff. Uh, you know, Tristan De Silva is someone I talked about with Matthew Winnick a couple days ago. I'm pretty interested in sort of what he is as a player, what he could provide, um, whether it's with the Pacers pick, whether it's with the Pistons pick. At this point, it might be with the Pacers pick if he's going to be on the Raptors just because he doubtfully makes it through the first round all the way into the second round with what he does and the sort of NBA readiness of his game. 
yeah, he's 23. Yeah, he's like an, he's longer in the tooth. But I think, uh, you know, you just got like kind of a ready-made skill set for the NBA. Maybe not the greatest on-ball defender, not super strong, kind of get bumped off his spot here and there, but seems to be a very smart positional defender. Made a lot of nice rotations last night, held up on post-ups and isos a couple times in that one as well, um, and just has like a nice, fluid, sort of multifaceted offensive game. I'm in on Tristan De Silva. He's my hmm, and he is how we are going to wrap up this episode thank you so much for tuning in as always we will be back again tomorrow to uh talk about something i don't know we'll figure it out maybe we'll get a guest on and have uh you know either draft talk or big picture raptors talk we'll figure it all out because it's a grind day to day <laughs> figuring out how to properly talk about this team hopefully i managed to do that all right today thank you so much for tuning in thanks for following subscribing rating reviewing telling a friend always appreciated when you support the show however you support the show and we'll be back again tomorrow thanks so much uh have a great night enjoy march madness it's kicking off oh my god watch the prospects baby it's gonna be a blast Bye bye <laughs>